I'm your host, Michael Dorsonville, and you're watching Ujamaa. Today we'll be talking about immigration in the U.S., but more specifically, the problems going on with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA for short, as well as discuss the communities affected. Immigration has always been a problem for the United States, dating all the way back to the early 1900s during the Industrial Revolution, and now things may be messier than ever. Did you know that in 2017, deportations of undocumented people already living in the U.S. increased by nearly 30 percent? DACA is a program created by previous U.S. President Barack Obama, which lets people 31 years of age and under do things a citizen of the U.S. can do, such as getting work permits, the ability to drive legally, as well as pursuing education, as long as they came to the States at the age of 16 or younger. However, DACA does not provide a direct pathway to citizenship, even though the status is able to be renewed two years at a time. People who are part of this program are called DREAMers. In September of 2017, the Trump administration announced that it plans to phase out the DACA program by the summer of 2018. This decision could affect as many as 800,000 DREAMers who have signed up for the program in 2012 when it was created. Immigrant rights advocates have said 200,000 more have sought legal status through DACA. <laughs> Today, we had the chance to sit down with a man who is very active in the immigrant justice community. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science with a focus on international affairs from the University of Central Florida, as well as a master's in urban policy from the New School. He is the organizer of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, an organization that helps black and brown communities organize and advocate for racial, social, and economic justice, along with immigration reform. Welcome to the show, Albert St. Jean. Thank so you. So what's up, man? How you Thanks doing? Thanks for having me, brother. Um, so first question I have is, who's Albert St. Jean? All right, so Albert St. Jean, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm the kid, I was born in Jersey, yeah. um, you know, grew up in both Jersey and Florida. Mm -hmm. I love hip hop. I love um, anything involving a the African diaspora, Pan-Africanism. Yeah. Um, and I love reading, mm -hmm. basketball, football. <laughs> yeah, everything, I, I love all, all those things. Food. And I love Haitian food. Haitian food? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My grandmother cooking? Yeah. Uh, amazing. <laughs> I'm Haitian too, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah, yo, yeah. Word, that's what's up. Nah, but she ain't got nothing on my mom's though. Nah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. we, we can talk about that later. <laughs> but nah. Um, so you come from a Haitian American family. Yeah. Uh, how was it growing up in the Haitian community? Yeah. So um, it was real dope because like we had like a really, really kind of like a village spirit. Mm -hmm. Like one of those things where like if you're out in the street and someone else sees you doing something, like yeah. they will get back or they will handle it themselves right there on the street. Um, and you know we really had like a um, like it, like e even close family friends become like family you yeah, know and, and, and you grow up yeah and mm -hmm. then you grow up together and everything and there was a strong sense of pride and like where we come from but we also had a lot of stigmas too you know because yeah. um um especially particularly other folks from other nationalities looked down on us because of the news coverage we was getting because mm -hmm. i grew up in the 80s and 90s oh, okay. so we had like a lot of a lot of kids weren't pretending that they were something that they were not yeah i'm like yo how you got a jamaica flag we go to church together. I know mm -hmm. who your parents are. Say you know? something else, hey? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of stigmas, you know, no. growing up. Um, what was that? What was the everyday struggle you faced back then? Um, back in the day, well, it was just mainly like with like um identity. Like um, for instance, a lot of times, like I felt the need to like validate myself as a Haitian American, yeah. and also even at times when I lived in areas where. 
because I moved around a lot and mm -hmm. I went to schools sometimes that were predominantly uh, white and there were times where I felt like I had to speak up for my race, yeah. you know, on top of my nationality, you know. So it was constant, constantly proving and disproving folks, whether they were other black folks or, or they were folks from outside of our race. What can you say, like, what got you starting to be an activist? So um, basically what it was is that, like, I always wanted to do something pertaining, like, helping people. I, mm -hmm. Either I wanted to do something creatively yeah. or I wanted to do something that um, was directly impacting people. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't want to go and be a lawyer because I felt like that's not where, where um, my strengths best suit me. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to go into politics because I felt like you don't really get anything done. You're just yeah. constantly running on this treadmill. So much and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and then it becomes instead of making an impact, just maintaining power. Mm -hmm. So um, I started organizing with Baji through friends I met at grad school, mm. at the new school, and um, and the way um, and that allowed me to, to tap directly into my community, yeah. you know, into networks that had already existed for me. You know, because of my relationships with people, family, mm -hmm. friends that I already had, it, especially in Brooklyn, yeah. and um, and it allowed me to do something about um, about a, a topic that had bothered me for so long. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing family on both sides of like either dealing with immigration issues or dealing with uh, the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. You know, and really understanding that, like, yeah, like I'm Haitian. And, and my family's West Indian and all of that, but my experience is that through a, of a black American lens, mm -hmm. you know? So understanding that duality and those intersections, and it just made sense for me to get involved with Baji. Mm -hmm. What do you believe is the importance of having immigrants come to the United States? Like, what's the main Yeah, well, because um, immigrants just keep adding different dimensions to this mm -hmm. country. Yeah. Like, you know, um, whether you were brought here by force, mm -hmm. uh, like African Americans, or whether you came here um, by choice, mm -hmm. um, we, um, we we come from stock that like really accentuate American culture and add yeah, flavor yeah. to it. And not only that, like strengthen this economy. I believe the very reason why this country is strong is because of the people that came here that are also oppressed. Mm -hmm. You know, the same people that are being oppressed in this country are the people that make this country what it is, especially the immigrants, and especially immigrants that came out here after 1965. Now let's take a break and find out what others in the community think about the situation. State your name, please. My name is Sergio LeBron. From New York City. All right. Uh, our question is, how do you feel about the state of immigration today? Sad. You have a lot of people that came here to the United States, especially the young kids. And actually, they have no fault in being here in the United States. They were brought here by their parents, and parents that also work very hard. Children going to school, going to college, and it's, it's uh, I mean, this is a free country, you know? And uh, we should be able to come to a solution on that as soon as possible. Okay, do you have any solutions in mind? Yeah, get rid of Trump, first thing. In the end of the day, uh, everybody has their opinions, everybody's entitled to voice their opinions, uh, whether you're right or wrong, but I'm, I'm all for the DECA. Your name, sir? Bebo. All right, Bebo. How do you feel about the state of immigration today? I feel like, I ain't gonna hold you. The immigration problem, is, it's a problem. Like, I ain't gonna hold so many immigrants taking people, like, jobs and all that. You gotta they kinda get rid of certain people, like that's just the true facts. No matter how many people from type of way about it, if they're taking jobs illegally, there's people who legally need a job, you know what I'm saying? What kind of jobs do you think immigrants are taking? Every and anything, anything that can fit themselves into, bro. Anything they could take for any cheaper price, they taking it. Like I ain't gonna they don't have no problem taking whatever prices. Like it is what it is, they gonna take it. Are your name, sir? The Escobar. Alright. Um, so how do you feel about the state of immigration today? I feel like as far as immigration, the Trump is doing, I'm Indian, so I won't really say that all immigrants need to get out of here because people say that they coming in, taking people's money, well, they hungry like us. They can't really eat where they from, you get what I'm saying? So they come over here and settle for less than make a dollar. We do that every day. So 
You get what I'm saying? Why would you want to do that for people? You got to put yourself on somebody else, in somebody else's shoes sometimes. Like, he don't know what they go through. He always had everything he ever wanted. His father was a millionaire. You get what I'm saying? Then he became a millionaire. So, like, he's just doing stuff to do stuff, just to say stuff, to say stuff. He just, that's just Trump. Like, that's just him. You get what I'm saying? But everything happened for a reason. You get what I'm saying? How, he been in there 100 days yet? Uh, yes, I think he's been there almost a year. It's just like everybody else. So, what's the hype about him? Like, that's what you should have thought though. He's a celebrity from Celebrity Apprentice. That's the Donald Trump's about. He got a, a mind for business. Yeah, but as far as political and all that, nah, that's not his lane. That's like a person that sing his whole life and then you wake up and say, Today I think I'm Jay-Z and I'm a rap like Jay-Z. No. You, that that takes practice, that takes time. Like it took him time to become a billionaire. He took his time, he took practice. Everything he did was for a reason. You can't just you get what I'm saying? Like, that's how I feel about it. Like, you shouldn't do that. Welcome back. And we have our guest, Albert St. Jean, here. Um, for those that don't know, can you briefly explain what Baji is and what type of work is done there? Yeah, so Baji is an organization that was founded in Oakland, California mm -hmm. by um, Pastor Reverend uh, Sauls and, yeah. um, I'm sorry, Kevin Sauls and um, Gerald Lenoir. Mm -hmm. um, they were also working on immigration law as well. Um, so what Baji is, it's an organization that addresses the issues that affect both black Americans and mm -hmm. black immigrants. That includes Afro-Latinos, Afro-Caribbean, and African as well. And um, a lot of what we do is we partner with organizations that help in mm -hmm. different facets with the, with the black community, yeah. um, whether it's um, the African community or, um, um, providing legal services there or some kind of cultural programming. Mm -hmm. we, we, we leverage our partnerships so that we can be able to um, do different kinds of programming yeah. with, um, with different folks, whether it's Know Your Rights, mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, um, hosting legal clinics for folks, um, connecting folks with legal representation, um, direct activism, whether we're yeah. gonna go do actions like around like policing and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like some of the campaigns we have, like specifically for New York City's like Safety Beyond Policing, mm -hmm. which we do with the Coalition and Broken Windows, and also Swipe It Forward, which addresses um, fair beating. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do a lot of advocacy around policing and immigration work. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in the organization? Who pushed you into it? So um, a good friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. Ben, ben um, he, uh, he's, he's Ugandan, he's from mm -hmm. uh, California, mm -hmm. and he'd been new living in New York for a while, and mm -hmm. we met each other some years ago at, um, as grad students at the New School, mm -hmm. and uh, both him and my friend um, Shannon Sherd, um, they put me on about you, let me know about it, and I started volunteering as part of the organizing oh, committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, when the opportunity came for like actual work with them, mm -hmm. like I jumped on it. What are some of the toughest obstacles you face or like the fa how you have faced in Baji? Yeah, so the biggest obstacles that we face is number one, you have um, the non-industrial uh, complex. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, the non-profit industrial complex mm -hmm. where um, a lot, like you have a lot of large non-profits who mm -hmm. really just um, are, are, are just like going off of platitudes and rhetoric yeah. and not really doing actual work. Okay. They co-opt the work that you tend to do or mm -hmm. try to overshadow the work that um, we, we're doing as an organization or take credit for it. Mm -hmm. That was um, one obstacle. Another obstacle is the way that um, local politicians, particularly those that we believe to be on our side and that look like us, mm -hmm. um, that, that um, gain legitimacy in the community, but yet, they're offering them nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and they mislead them into thinking that, oh, like, um, that we're a true sanctuary city yeah. and that the NYPD is not here and is not going to cause them any harm and things like that. Like, those are some of the biggest obstacles as well as, like, um, also people's fear, like mm -hmm. genuine fear and the lack of, and, and, and the, um, well, I'm trying to think of what Martin Luther King said about, like, those who say nothing and do nothing in a time of need mm -hmm. um, are like the the ones that you have yeah, to worry those, about the yeah. most. Mm -hmm. um, that's very rampant within the black um, uh, religious community. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that it's universal, because mm -hmm. you have some churches that are and mosques that are very active, but um, not it's not as widespread as it should be. Yeah. Here's a historical fact for you. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Fact of the Day. I'm Jose, and I'm here to talk to you about an immigrant to the U.S. with a resounding legacy. Marcus Mosea Garvey, an activist, entrepreneur, and not to mention an immigrant, was born in St. Anne Bay of August 1887. As a self-educated man, he is credited as the leader of the Pan-Africanism movement. He's founded several organizations, such as the United Negro Improvement Association, businesses such as the Black Star Line, and even published a newspaper titled The Negro World, promoting African-American unity, business, and a vision of resettlement back into Africa. By 1920, the UNIA claimed about 4 million members. The Black Star Line was founded by the UNIA. It was a shipping company that established trade and commerce between black people across the world, including North America, South America, the Caribbean, and Africa. Marcus Garvey was undoubtedly a controversial person. He was criticized by other leaders of his time, and was even spied on by former FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Believing that Garvey was inciting violence across the U.S., Hoover placed spies inside the UNIA, doing anything possible to find information that he was a criminal. Garvey even faced criticism from other African American leaders, even those in civil rights movements. W.E.B. Du Bois disapproved of Garvey's separatist ideas, saying he was the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race in America. Despite the controversy that was part of his life, and his organization is not likely to the present day, Marcus Garvey certainly had an influence on civil rights and racial justice. His pan-African ideas drove black pride and unity for years to come, remaining in other groups such as the Black Panthers. Even in the present, Marcus Mosea Garvey is a symbol of black power and pride, as well as an immigrant who inspired the United States and beyond. Well, it looks like time has run out for today, but the events still remain in history. Thank you for listening to today's Fact of the Day. We'd like to thank you for watching. As always, history today isn't history of tomorrow. Get out there and make your own history, and we'll see you next time. How do you visualize the future for undocumented immigrants in the U.S.? Well, the way... Um that it could turn out, given the traje traje trajectory that we're going, mm -hmm. um, they will c undocumented folks will continue to be exploited, yeah. continue to live in the shadows, um, and this will have a greater effect on the greater society as a mm -hmm. whole. You know, because once you have people that are most marginalized not being taken care of, mm -hmm. I mean, it affects the rest of society, it lowers the standard yeah. and the bar for the rest of us. I believe that. Um, the way it should go if we keep fighting mm -hmm. and, and we keep in lock of step. Mm -hmm. um, I can see folks coming out of the shadows, living a life of dignity, yeah. um, you know, earning more money that they can send back home and, and contribute to the economy here and to their families here. Mm -hmm. um, and just being able to live a full life. Yeah. You mentioned the, the way it, it can possibly go. Mm -hmm. um, the current situation with DACA, how mm -hmm. do you feel about, like, what are your opinions on that? Um, the current situation to me is sad for two reasons. Number one, it's like, why would you want to pick on people who came here as children? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Who like it just shows the extent of how, the cruelty of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, but also, the second issue I have with it is that it's DACA is being used as a wedge yeah. to get people to forget about other undocumented folks, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's helping to perpetuate this good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative, which is bogus, mm -hmm. because especially for us um, who come from black immigrant families, you know, something like three-fourths of black immigrants are deported because of their interactions with law enforcement, mm -hmm. because we live in communities that's so over-policed. Yeah. And it's like, what are we going to do to protect them? What are we going to do to protect the parents of the kids who get DACA and Dreamers and so forth. Yeah. You know, um, I think that by focusing only on one, mm -hmm. what it does is t it takes away from everything else and yeah. really what you're doing is weakening the, the struggle for undocumented people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, adding on to that, what impact mm -hmm. do you find that Donald Trump has led to the cause? So the Trump administration made things harder. Mm -hmm. It also made things easier in a sense because it took the mask off what America really is. Yeah. And it took and it really shed light on the fact that this is truly and genuinely a racist society. Yeah. Everything that he's saying, everything that he's doing mm -hmm. is white America's subconscious. It's its id 
come to manifest. And I think like a lot of um, white folks um, have come to realize that and a lot of them feel ashamed by it and are acting in different ways around it yeah. um, because they weren't aware of it. Whereas other folks who are, P, you know, POC, mm -hmm. like most of us knew that this was a racist yeah. society. Some of us were blaming ourselves, mm -hmm. but now that we see who Actually, can, that yeah, this man, that there's a system that allows this man to become president, mm -hmm. we see what white privilege really is. And I think that that kills a lot of that noise. So mm -hmm. you see the flaws in that. Yeah, everything. exactly. <clears throat> Do you believe our politicians can be relied on to support immigrants? Nope. Yeah. Uh, what can they do to assist your cause? What can they do? Stop mm -hmm. lying to people. Stop lying. Stop acting like you're in a position of patronage. Mm -hmm. What politicians could do if they're genuine about helping people yeah. is to go to the community and get their cues from them. Yeah. Be beholden to them. Stop taking financial contributions for your campaigns mm -hmm. from, from private sector. Start focusing on getting public funding for your campaigns. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? These are the things that politicians could do, and then they could be genuinely held accountable by the people. Yeah. And when they do policy legislation, all of those things, when they start drafting their policies, mm -hmm. they need to start consulting their communities more and genuinely and be fully transparent with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so where do you see Baji in the next five, ten years, and what accomplishments do you hope to have made by then? Um, I, I see Baji in the next five, ten years, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically just hopefully like being able to provide a lot of services on their own to the community, mm -hmm. but as well still like um, strengthening um, partners, um, doing more capacity building, yeah. um, actually like, um, you know, yeah, like I see if we continue on, on the same trajectory, like I, I kind of, I, I see us really um, being a staple in the community mm -hmm. and one that um, helps to bring uh, transparency and accountability to mm -hmm. the community. Um, as you were talking earlier about what you hope to have mm -hmm. happen with uh, immigration, do you think that will add on to that? Like, will Baji have help with that? Like a lot? Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. already like um, we've been able to um, help with pushing the, the narrative around black immigrants. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the complexities around um, crim immigration, mm -hmm. you know, because before not many people were talking about it outside of us and Docu Black, um, Families for Freedom, that's another yeah. organization and a few others. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, thank you, Albert, for taking the time to come and sit with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank it you. It was nice having you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Peace. Thanks for joining us on today's episode where we took a deeper look into the significant social issue that is immigration in the United States. Oh, and remember to follow us at the Youth Channel on YouTube and Instagram for more content.